Our second reading this morning will be from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And you'll find that on page 607 in the Pew Bible. If you'll please stand in honor of God's word as we read it. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can, could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does no, not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. Every now and then, it's more often than every now and then, but I'm aware of just how much goes on here. Think about the, the ladies who put together pretty flowers for us and uh, the wreaths on the wall, and I think about the uh, the different people helping with security and... Um, and the ushers, who uh, y'all just y'all just plug along with it. This side of COVID, we treat ushers like professional panhandlers. We're just sort of like, no, 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 I, none for me. Uh, but I'm grateful for uh, all of the people involved in in ministry here. So. You have your note sheet there in your bulletin. What good it's going to do you, I don't know. That whole center part we're not going to get to. We'll, we'll pick it up next week. But in a lot of ways, we're going to plan to conclude our concentrated study on love. We began what became a series by considering what we are to be and what direction we are to have as a church so that we can move forward confidently to be sure that we're following the directives of the master, not just following the popularized patterns of the day that are deemed to be successful for that time. We found such a directive in the new commandment from Jesus Christ that he gives in John 13. And that preceded his directive in the Great Commission. In John 13, Jesus Christ said, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another. As I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. It is almost like he was getting at something. Just this continual repeating of this. Our tendency is to look at the Great Commission there at the end of Matthew and, and say, that is evangelism, that is missions, that is reaching the world for Christ. But John 13, 34, and 35 is a precursor to the Great Commission. It is a precursor. It, it came before it is foundational. It is the command given by the Lord as he prepares to depart from the earth. And it is the distinctive of his followers that he puts forth. We spent some time with Peter a while ago as he battled with his understanding of how things should work. 
and we kind of walked with him as he submitted to God's plan. We witnessed his failure in denying his Lord, and we saw how he was restored by the Lord. With what words? Do you love me? Agape love is going to be the evidence of a changed life. It is going to be the foundation that forms the backbone of evangelism. Not mere words. Not just philanthropic actions. Not trying really hard to be a nice guy. But instead, revealing transformed lives. Transformed lives. That means that there's a change that's been taken, that has taken place. Transformed lives where we display what we have been experienced or what we have experienced. Nate read that to us from Romans chapter five. The love of God has been poured out in our hearts. So this is just an overflow that is to be seen, revealing transformed lives where we display what we have experienced. And dear people, that is going to generate jeers. It is going to generate people saying, that's nutty. Because it's going to be difficult. And it's going to be out of step. It's going to be difficult and out of step. And if it was just difficult and out of step from unbelievers, that would be understandable. That would be one thing. But this, is, this sort of living is going to be at odds even with Christians because it battles against our sensible selfishness. It will generate jeers because it's difficult and it's out of step, but it will draw others to Jesus Christ. It will draw others to Jesus Christ as we advertise what he is like. That was the calling card of the early church. They're recorded in the first part of the book of Acts. Much like the way we jump past the Lord's commandment in John 13 before his death, and we jump to the Great Commission, which was before his ascension into heaven, in similar ways we leapfrog to the end of Acts chapter 2, for that exciting statement, and the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. But in the process, we skip what preceded that outcome. What were the distinguishing characteristics of the early church? There are a number of them. You don't have much room to jot, a spa- uh, to jot down notes, but maybe you can find something and write some of these down. We have... Peter's pointed preaching, pointed preaching, saying things like, in verse 36, this Jesus whom you crucified is Lord and Christ, which is to say, you killed the Messiah who came to save us. So yeah, pointed. And we might be inclined to say, uh, instead of that, could we maybe just have a little chicken noodle soup for the soul. In verse 40, he says, be saved from this perverse generation. Look around you. This is twisted. Everything is messed up, and it's not the way it's supposed to be. Ah, I was thinking more your best life now. Could we we have some of that? Um, maybe, could I have a life enhancement for 100, please? Was that a Jeopardy reference? But, but what is taking place here, Peter has some pointed preaching going on that preceded this outcome. We also see that the Christians were studying and being taught the Bible. The Bible was central to what's going on. They were learning from it, and living according to it. They were living life together. 
dealing with things that matter, talking about things that matter. This was not a social club. This was not a good people gathering place. They were eating together, praying together, prioritizing meeting together. There were supernatural things taking place. The Christians were taking care of each other there in 44 and 45, generously giving to those who had need, willingly parting with their goods to support another. We skipped the fact that these people were weird. They weren't just about themselves. They were very different. They sacrificially gave of themselves. And they had lives, get this, they had lives that were decidedly inconvenienced. And I ask you, is that what we are pursuing? They were changed people who loved one another. It was obvious they were changed people who loved one another and the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. As I was talking with one of you and you said, yeah, it would be easier to have an evangelism program than it would be to live like that. But love is what we are called to. And dear people, it's going to be out of step even with the American church. But these are the directives from the master. Love is what we are called to. Love is what the Lord commands of his followers, which brought us to 1 Corinthians 13, to what this love is and to see what this love is not. Verse 4 begins with a brief description of what love is. Love suffers long and is, in, and is kind. And then proceeds to spend the bulk of the next couple of verses articulating what love is not. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Love is not puffed up. Love does not behave rudely. Love does not seek its own. Love is not provoked. Love thinks no evil. It does not rejoice in iniquity. As we come to the end of verse 6, the structure of the description seems to bookend as it concludes with a stark contrast from, from what love is not and concludes with what love is. Love thinks no evil. Love does not rejoice in iniquity. This does not deny that there may be ample evidence of wrongdoings. It merely does not make that the point of focus. It merely does not make that a, a matter of emphasis. Thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. It delights not in elevating wrongs, not in drawing battle lines. Oh, you're with them? I, I'm with these ones over here. Not in highlighting disagreements. Being united in opposition builds up no one. And we need to be reminded of these things from the word of God. Love delights in the truth. The truth is what is affirming and edifying. Love is affiliated with truth. They go together. Love takes the side of truth, which is a good thing for us to remember. Love is not something that is neutral. Love is not a thing where it's like, ah, I could go either way. No. Love takes sides. Love is not neutral and it does not compromise what is true. Love seeks to further what is truth and what is reality. We cannot be involved in affirming what is not true. Regardless of what we might be told, 
or regardless of what we might seek to convince ourselves to be more palatable, that is not love. Love rejoices in the truth. As we come to verse 7, we learn that love is defined by what it does. In rejoicing in truth, the believer seizes the opportunity to live out the confidence in the gospel we proclaim. Here's an opportunity to demonstrate the truth of the gospel. That sin has been dealt with in Jesus Christ and no longer held against us. Therefore, we are no longer bound to function like the lost world who knows nothing of God's forgiveness. But we can, we can instead display what it looks like not to be bound by carnal vengefulness. That's going to make all sorts, of, all sorts of sense to people being enslaved by our sinful tendencies. We, we are freed from that because love rejoices in the truth. Such a contrast from the defeatist just reveling in wrongs. Dear people, this is a this is a this is a message that is so contrary to our our world right now. When we are when, when there's sort of a hierarchy of who's the biggest victim, love rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things. Love it. Love covers. It covers. Charles Spurgeon said this about such a love. Such a love never proclaims the errors of others. Well, I just need you to hear me out. I, I just need you to know this. Love bears all things. It, it covers. It never proclaims the truth. The, it never proclaims the errors of others. It refuses to see faults unless it can kindly help in their removal. It stands in the presence of a fault with a finger on its lips. Love rushes to intervene, to intercept humiliation. It's the difference between announcing, oh, somebody left the barn door open, and noticing and quickly drawing them aside to let them know they need to tend to their zipper. Love bears all things. It covers. It is the protectiveness we saw demonstrated by Jesus Christ with the woman caught in adultery. Chester McCauley wrote, this is the quality of love that does not wish to broadcast what is bad, even if it is true. For love does not rejoice in iniquity and therefore does not repeat such things. Love rejoices in the truth. It bears all things. Love believes all things. Here we are thrust back in the way, into contending with the way that we think. If we've not been tempted at this point, we're going to be inclined to raise the yeah buts. Yeah, but I believed somebody. I trusted them, and they betrayed me. So I can't go along with this because that's not the way it works in the real world. But remember that love rejoices in the truth. Love does not deny what is reality. But neither does the truth of God cease to be believable because we encounter suffering. Suffering that we need to bear when we obey. Love delights in the truth and believes all things. Dear people, this is hard stuff because we are we are trained to be skeptics but love does not don a a leery eye 
with a callous view of others. Love desires to be trusting rather than suspicious. Love does not assume and anticipate the worst. Oh, I'm not a pessimist, I'm a realist. I remember talking with someone and they're like, oh, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not a pessimist. A and I said, you can claim that the glass is half full, but that's only because somebody spit in it. Because that's sort of the way that I view things. Assuming such a depressive view of others is also the makings of those so-called self-fulfilling prophecies where if we declare people scoundrels, they act accordingly. Or more egregious, we accuse them in our mind, thinking evil of them, and likewise determine every action and intention of theirs supports our foregone conclusion that they are wicked entirely. Surprise, surprise. No, love is gracious and generous. I know that everyone could raise their hand and say, yeah, but I, I, have, I have examples to the contrary. I get it. But God says this is the way, this is what love is, and this is what we're commanded to be. Love is gracious and generous. Love believes all things. Such a levity, think about that, a, a lightness in contrast to gloomy pessimism, which, which is tough because we, we turn on the news and we find out about how bad everybody else is. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. Again, addressing the way that we think. Harry Ironside of Moody Church writes, love credits people with the best possible motives. <whistles> love may see something upon which a very bad construction may be put, but it waits a moment and says, could I put a better construction upon that? I will not put the wrong one if I can possibly find a good one. I will hope for the best. I will never be guilty of marring a brother or sister's reputation because of something said or done that looks unwise to me and yet might be innocent. I wasn't going to mention this, but I, whenever I think about this, I think about, I think about my wife when we were, we'd been married weeks, months. And, and she said, hey, could you, uh, could you try to remember to hang up the towels so that it doesn't get left on the bed and leave a wet spot? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I can do that. And, uh, and I thought to myself, um, it was really nice how she brought it up. I mean, because, because, I mean, hang with me on this. She could have said, oh, great. I married a knuckle-dragging moron who can't even pick up after himself. Because I can almost guarantee you that after she asked me to remember to hang up my towel, I can almost guarantee you that I didn't do it every time. But I, but I do remember when I did, and I, I could have sworn I was the tie to evolution because I could have felt my tail wagging when she said, I really appreciate how you hung up your towel. <laughs> but this is what it could have been. It could have been, oh, he's just doing that to annoy me. He's just doing that because he knows that I asked him to do it and he was not doing it deliberately to make a point. But 
love hopes all things. Is there a, a bad construction that could be put on this? Sure. But could I find a better construction? Yeah. Think about this. The Christian faith is a message of hope. The Bible is a book of hope. The shepherd leaves the flock to find the lost lamb. The father strains his eyes looking for his prodigal son who left home, different than the prodigal son who stayed home. Romans 8.28 says that God will cause all th things to work together for those who love him, to those who are called according to his purpose. And that's, that's dealing with a whole lot of mess. Gideon of old, from the time of the judges, is going off to fight with a meager army with pitchers and torches, trusting in, hoping to witness God do a work in unlikely situations. And we may look at this and say, yeah, but. But let's look at, speaking of an unlikely outcome, let's look at Ephesians 2 to see what a long shot we are. Ephesians 2, beginning in verse 1, says this, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. How much did he have to work with? How much feedback are you going to get from someone who's dead? No, you have to do it all yourself. This is describing a work of God and his loving grace. Verse 1, the dead he makes alive. Verse 2, we see that we are under the power and dominion of the devil. Children of wrath, as verse 3 describes us. But in verse 4, God mercifully loved we who had made ourselves unlovely. Verse 5. Yet verse 6 tells us God will affiliate us with the blessings of his perfect son because he desired to show his love to us. Verse 7. And he offers the gift of salvation in Jesus Christ, which we can receive through faith, verse 8, not through good works, verse 9, that we might claim. But God still has good works that he is going to accomplish through us. Verse 11 says, Therefore, remember that you once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. You're outsiders and strangers from the covenants of promise. Ooh, great promises, but they weren't for you, Gentile. Having, what's that say? Having no hope. And without God in the world, dear people, may we not be unmoved by the reality that this is the state of those who are apart from God. But now in Christ Jesus, only because of Christ Jesus, you who once, this is a reference to our bleak history, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Verse 14 tells us that 
Jesus Christ is now our peace. And he has brought us together with God. Establishing peace and a new relationship. Verse 15. 16 says, having removed the barriers of sin, the offense removed through his death on the cross. What a message of peace, verse 17. Interesting in this message, verse 18, we have peace with and access to God. No longer strangers, verse 19. <laughs> No longer strangers, but a part of the household of God. 20 through 23, it's all built upon and built by and dependent upon Jesus Christ. Dear people, if there was ever a long shot, it was our lot. If Jesus Christ can accomplish an eternal rift between rebels and the perfect God of the universe, we can trust and hope that he will do a work in our lives, in our situations, and therefore not become overcome with hopeless despair because love hopes all things. Such a contrast from being stuck in the past versus being able to anticipate the future. This looks bleak, but let's see what God will do. Love hopes all things. Love endures all things. This is so good. Chester McCauley draws this together. When love has no evidence... It believes all things. When the evidence is adverse, love hopes all things. And when hope is disappointed, love endures all things. This does not fit well in our God just wants me to be happy idea. Love endures. It endures annoyances. It endures difficulty. It endures an insult. It endures unmet expectations. It endures and it continues on even though it is hard. But it's with a spirit that is more than just, all right, let's just get this over with, of just sort of this tolerant resignation, but rather actively confident, victorious confidence, victorious confidence that God is at work and will accomplish his good purposes. He will be faithful and he will enable me to be faithful. Because love never fails. And this is the love that Jesus Christ commands of us. This is to be the distinguishing mark of we, the followers of Jesus Christ. The distinctive mark, not our political activism not our moral outrage, not our irrefutable logic, not our witty retorts, but our love. More than just read in our weddings, we need to live out 1 Corinthians 13. We need to live it out with God's definition of love. Husbands, wives, our spouses need to see this lived out in us. Our kids need to see it. Children, 
This isn't just something you looked up when I said children. Alex, you are a man. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, children, this is not something that we just talk about at church and then we can strangle our sibling with the seatbelt on the way home. This is something that gets lived out. There is a near endless supply of twisted concepts of love that are generated in my own twisted mind and imported from others. We don't need those. The world is not dying for Ethan's version of love. They don't need Peter's love or even your concept of love. They need to hear of and see the love of God displayed that has been poured out in us. Oh, that we would love one another as Jesus Christ has loved us. May there be a palpable presence of that love in this place and emanating outward for the sake of the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. May it be so. Our closing hymn is in the supplement hymn book number 33. May the mind of Christ, my Savior. y'all listening to the words we're singing we got some good good truth going out there receive the benediction from Romans 15 now may the God of patience 
and comfort. Grant you to be like-minded toward one another. According to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth, may you glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, this is our desire. I pray that you would grow this in us so that it becomes an obsession that we would be identified as your people by our love. May we display you well. Pray in Jesus' name.